Welcome everybody to the Toronto Tug event. Thank you everybody to, for coming. Today we're going to talk about data careers. We wanted to try something a little bit different because, you know, we're on Zoom a lot. So we thought we'd try a little bit of a different format and have, uh, and that's why this meeting is, it got a little bit, is set up differently. So you all are able to talk. Uh, we'll ask you if you can just mute your lines for now. Uh, the uh, panelists are going to introduce themselves first. So we ask you if you'd like all mute your lines for now. And then uh, if we have time, I mean, we do have a bit of a tight window. It's only an hour uh, because we understand you're like you're on lunch and you're you, you, we thank you all for joining us. But, um, you know, we don't want it, this to drag all afternoon. So we want the questions to be pretty tight. But if we don't have that much questions, we'll just open it up and you guys can just ask your questions. And uh, if it's if our time is tight, and we have a lot of questions. Um, Catherine, Roland and myself will kind of uh, sort of moderate that a bit and we will field the questions just to keep it a little bit tighter. Uh, but anyway, so for now, if you, you guys don't mind uh, muting your lines so that we can, uh, so everybody can hear the presenters. So uh, yeah, so basically we have a data and careers panel. We have three people. We're very happy uh, to introduce you. Thank you very much for to Sahar, uh, Mark and Fuyo for coming to uh, talk about their career. Uh, yeah, super excited to hear uh, how their careers have evolved and, and you know, uh, what they, um, how data has influenced them uh, through their career. And obviously, we're going to have some uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, just to note, uh, because we do send out emails when there's a new event, uh, a new Toronto Tug event. Uh, but in order to get the emails, you need to subscribe to, for updates on the on our Toronto user group community page. So it's like community.tableau, Toronto, something. Oh, there, right. Catherine, obviously put right. it on the slide. Very weird. <laughs> Usergroups.tableau.com slash Toronto. So if you go to that, <laughs> if you go to that web page, please, and subscribe for updates, then it, you know, you're sure that you're always in the loop about what's going on in the Toronto Tug. Uh, we can keep in touch with you. And if we have any other questions for you or any surveys or any feedback we want, we'll use that uh, list as well. Uh, so you know, it's a great way to keep in touch with us um, by signing up there. Uh, also, uh, if uh, anybody would like to present at a future Tug, uh, you know, I, uh, Julie, I watched the uh, Montreal tug. It was really well done. And I, it, you know, you had several presenters and I thought, you know, what a great idea. Like you just had a couple of presenters that just, or you had a presenter that just presented for like 10 minutes. And I thought that's a great idea. Like we should throw it out to the community. If anybody has something that they find really inspirational, they just want to talk and they don't want it to be like a big deal. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It can just be like a couple of minutes, a couple of slides about something that they, um, are super inspired by. So uh, please reach out to Roland, Catherine, or myself um, and let us know if you would like to present at a future tug. Awesome. So without further ado, um, we are on to our panelists. Uh, over I to get you. the lucky, you? lucky, lucky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark, I get to present you. I will be your fun point of contact for the questions or not fun. If you're not having fun, just send me a note. Um, <laughs> but either way, folks, this is Mark. Uh, Mark will introduce himself. We will have his verbiage up on the screen just in case you need it. Um, and if Mark misses anything that's on the screen, I'll make sure we say it out loud for our folks who are on the line. Mark, over to you. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, nice to be here today. Um, so my name is Mark Bradbourne. I'm a national solutions engineer for Tableau, um, which basically puts me on the sales side of the house. Um, but I spent the prior 22 years before I joined Tableau as a practitioner. Um, I accidentally started working in data in 1997. And I say accidentally because I actually started as a web designer. Uh, and my roommate's dad worked at this company called Pioneer Standard Electronics. And they had this senior programmer analyst position. And I was like, okay, let's interview and try for it. And turns out I was building data warehouses. <clears throat> I've used a bunch of tools over the years and built a lot of data warehouses for a lot of different companies um, in probably pretty much every industry that I can think of. Um, and in 2012, I kind of fell in love with Tableau. I discovered it after being a business objects junkie for a good decade. Um, and really then just, I'd been kind of tool agnostic other than the business object stuff, but uh, really became fascinated with not just Tableau the product, but the community and 
and all of the things that that really happened. And and honestly, once I discovered Tableau, I really kind of from a skills, I feel like I, you know, kind of accelerated through community involvement and practice. Honestly, it's something that I never really thought about doing. Um, uh, you know, it's like practicing, you know, how do you properly present data uh, to be, you know, as effective and ex as accessible as possible. Um, so I feel like from an analytical standpoint, like the Tableau community really kind of changed the game for me career wise. Um, <clears throat> along the way, I was a Tableau ambassador for a short time. Uh, before I joined the company, I had to give it up after I joined. Same with uh, leading the Cleveland user group. Um, so just through kind of being involved, heavy networking, um, it's been quite an interesting career. Uh, a couple of interesting stops that I had on the slide. You can see I worked at Harley Davidson for a bit. I am a biker. Uh, that is my motorcycle and that is my actual license plate. Um, I am that big of a nerd. <clears throat> um, I worked at Sherwin Williams Paint for a while uh, where I got to do some work in Latin America, uh, which was fun. Um, so yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, but yes, I see somebody's mentioning my website, Sons of Hierarchies. That is the blog that I write uh, on occasion. Um, it started as a joke at uh, Tableau Conference 2015 um, when I worked for Harley. <clears throat> we went out and we actually rented motorcycles and uh, rode through the desert, which was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it was a bunch of nerds on motorcycles. So it was a good laugh. Um, I also uh, do a podcast currently called Just Five Minutes that you can find on most podcast platforms. Um, so yeah, is other are we doing questions like now or kind of at the end as a group? At the end as a group, yeah. This was a okay. wonderful introduction to you, Mark. Thank you so much. Yeah, excellent. And for those of you who can't see, uh, Mark's license plate says "Visit." That is freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. I have the, uh, the uh, pleasure of introducing you to Sahara Nazami. Uh, I think it was back in 2014 or 15 when I walked by Sahara's office and she was working on a visualization that caught my eye. I stopped dead in my tracks, honestly, and uh, I was truly amazed. And after a brief conversation with her about the data and the view, I knew two things. One, I got to work with this person and learn from her. And two, I can make a career out of presenting data and, story and storytelling just like that. So lucky enough, both came true. I had the opportunity to work with Sahar at CIBC. Currently, she is the Senior Director of Advanced Analytics and Data Management with Internal Audit at CIBC. And that's one of Canada's biggest banks. She's had a very interesting career. Uh, she's a mentor to many, and she was also a mentor to me. She volunteers her time with several groups and is a real advocate for inclusion and diversity. So Sahar, welcome to the community. Thanks, Roland. And uh, thank you for sandwiching me between you know, a Harley riding musician nerd and Fuyo, who I know has an amazing presentation coming up. And even my picture is boring, so corporate. So glad at least I'm wearing red. I'm not that boring, guys. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's, it's amazing. I've been um, an advocate and a user for Tableau since you write the role in 2013, 2014. Um, I've used it in many, many different teams. I first introduced it in CIBC in 2013 through a, um, we had a big, big project going, a $3 billion contract that we were working on. And I brought in Tableau just to slice and dice data, no visualization, no dashboards were shared, nothing like that. But we were doing a, I, I call it the first um, real-time decision support project that we did at CIBC because real-time, we were slicing and dicing data as people were at the negotiation table. Uh, so it was the first time I, I had done a lot of support for CIBC and I've reviewed a lot of contracts, but it was the first time that the language of a big contract um, was vetted through data. So they were, um, you know, live people would email me and say, hey, you know, this is a, this is a term they're putting in the contract. Can we do this? And I would test it on the data and say, no. I, I don't have that data point. So don't say that we will be, you know, selecting people with these characteristics because we don't have that characteristics char characteristic in the data. So a little bit going back, I consider myself having been in data analytics for 20 years, but um, more than half of that time 
um, my titles <laughs> did not reflect that. So for those of you who've been in analytics for a long time, you know this, um, there were quant people, there were modelers, and then there were reporters and then became BI and then slowly big data, slowly the term data science. So we have been you know, called different things through, throughout the time. The title started coming most recently. Uh, I never knew that I could be considered a data scientist. So my background is my undergrad is software engineering. Then I did a master's in economic systems engineering and then I did um, my MBA. So later on, somebody was telling me, oh, you're the original data scientist because you have program, you have econometrics and then you have uh, business. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> So on paper, well, yes, I'm a data scientist. In reality, no, I, I just lead teams of amazing data scientists and data engineers. My current role, I, I did, I was in um, credit cards at CIBC. I was at finance at CIBC, marketing, the CDO. Right now I'm in internal audits. And the interesting thing is that surprisingly, internal audit is the most interesting part of all of my roles. We cover the entire bank. Um, and also my team, this is the first team that I led that I have both the analytics side and the data side. It's amazing when you, when you give people what they're good at to do, you know, like you talk to data scientists and analysts and they complain about the data prep side. You know, we were talking about data prep a little bit earlier, but 80% of the time is preparing data, 20% is um, doing analytics. But guess what? I have people who are very good at finding data and preparing data. And I have people who are very good at analyzing data. Putting these two together has been amazing. I know I started advocating for that about four years ago and more and more I'm seeing across the board, my colleagues are posting for roles that have data engineers embedded into the analytics teams. That's a, like we've always been, I consider ourselves and um, you know, Roland was part of that as well. You know, So when, when we started bringing Tableau to the bank, um, and we were doing roadshows, people thought we work for a Tableau. So we had to start every meeting by saying, we are your CIBC colleagues. You know, similar to what Mark said, we, we, were, we would say that we are tool agnostic. This is one of the tools that is available to you. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been interesting going through this journey, you know, 2013, starting advocating for self-serve analytics. Around 2015, 16 is when I started advocating for, you know, don't hire just programmers and data scientists in your teams. Start hiring, um, you know, UX designers, start hiring people who are storytellers. So I was telling people, go to the school of communications and go to the school of journalism and start hiring people, not just uh, engineering schools. And then about three years ago, we made the shift to um, if you're a mature analytics team, um, analytics is a product. So we are in that stage of maturity. So over the past two, three years, our most recent hires have been application developers and web developers because we are packaging stuff and we are serving it up to our clients. So it's been an interesting journey going through this maturity, analytics maturity models with different teams. I think I'll start one with a new team pretty soon and I'm super excited about it. Thanks for having me guys. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for coming. We we're super uh, excited to hear your experience. Um, and now we're going to throw it over to Fio. Uh, uh, sorry, Rio. <laughs> Stumbling over my words now. I'm trying to talk too fast. Okay. So now uh, it is over to Fuyo, and uh, she, you would know her as the uh, one of the leaders of the Calgary Tug, but it, she is, as she's going to prove in a minute, she is so much more than that. Um, she's had an exciting career in data. Uh, and, you know, I suggest that you probably should all check out the Calgary Tug as well, especially since now that we're all virtual, it's uh, super convenient. But uh, over to you, Fuyo, to tell us all about your exciting career in data. Thanks so much. Uh, let me just make sure I can get my slides up. Um, is this all right? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So uh, my name is Fuyo Watanabe, and I'm a Tableau freelancer. I'm a co-founder of the Calgary Tableau user group, and you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter if you want to say hi. My presentation is called Tableau, Motherhood, and Neurodiversity. So. Uh oh, hang on. I'm on the wrong window to advance my slides. I'm sorry, guys. 
There we go. So I began my career as a Crystal Reports developer way, way back when it was first owned by Seagate. One day, a manager showed me an impressive array of charts that he had created in Excel. He had a bar chart from January to December, and I asked him, what happened in July? You, you did really well. The July bar was double the size of the other months. He said, I'm not sure, you know, it's more likely some kind of data entry mistake. And I said, don't you wish you could just double click on it and see what's under there? And he told me, yeah, can you do that? And that sparked my journey to find a tool that would. In 2007, I discovered Tableau and I said, I never want to use another BI tool ever again. Sadly, I had to bide my time because nobody was hiring for a Tableau designer back then. I went to the first Tableau conference at the Edgewater in Seattle and I was so energized. But I came back and I continued to work as a business objects report developer and a business analyst, waiting for data visualization to become a thing. Even though it wasn't required in the jobs I had at the time, I bought a personal copy of Tableau and always had it in my toolbox. I was often able to introduce Tableau to my manager or to do a small proof of concept, but it wasn't until 2011 that I was finally hired as a Tableau specialist. I finally made it. So then of course, a couple of years later, I became a mother. My son was born with multiple disabilities and he spent a lot of time in the hospital. It was a few tough years. He had five surgeries before his second birthday. He is deaf, blind, nonverbal, and not yet able to walk. There were days when I wondered if my destiny was to become his full-time caregiver, which I was fully prepared to do. I mean, look how cute he is. And then a funny thing happened. Headhunters started calling me looking for a Tableau specialist. I could not believe that my skills were finally in demand and I was absolutely not able to take on full-time work. So I would explain that I could only work part-time and I needed lots of time off for specialist appointments. And on occasion, I might need a week or two to stay in the hospital when my son was being treated. I fully expected them to walk away, but then they still gave me the jobs. I did a variety of part-time gigs while I was on my extended mat leave, and I finally returned to full-time work when my son was about to turn five. So fast forward to the spring of 2021, and I find myself really struggling to focus. Trying to work from home during the pandemic, I go through a bunch of testing with my doctor, and he suspects that I've been living with undiagnosed ADHD. When I considered the term ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, I thought, no way, I'm absolutely the opposite of hyperactive. But then he said, you're the inattentive type of ADHD. And I said, oh. So here's why I couldn't just walk you through the timeline of my career. I've had 17 jobs over my 22 year career, and that's not even including the really short ones. I've always been energized at the start of a new project. I love the design stage and gathering requirements and prototyping and solving all the complicated problems. But I hate the maintenance stage. I get so bored. So today I understand that about myself and I realize I've subconsciously carved out this career path that accommodates it. As a freelancer, I get to jump from project to project. I feel like Tableau is a match made in heaven for my creative brain. And I think a lot of other neurodivergents are attracted to it for that reason as well. So even though I struggle with boring things like filling out timesheets and invoicing clients, being a Tableau freelancer has been an amazing career path for my brain that thinks too much and hates getting bored. So if I can leave you with just a couple of thoughts about my journey, it's that I believe none of this would have been possible without Tableau. One of the best things about Tableau is that you can use it outside of an enterprise setting. It costs nothing. Tableau Public has come such a long way. The Tableau community is huge and so welcoming. There's so much free education available for beginners and challenges to keep your skills up for advanced users. Makeover Monday, Workout Wednesday, Tableau Publix Viz of the Day. So even when I wasn't working as a Tableau specialist, I was always using it. I was using it to look at real estate and mortgages for myself. I was using it to win arguments and to prove my friends wrong. 
I always found ways to use it at work. Even if the project was being built in another tool, I often did my prototypes and my data exploration in Tableau. Tableau has changed so much over the years. I'll admit when I returned to it after four years off, I was worried I would be completely left behind. And in some ways I was blown away by the crazy new designs people were capable of. I remember when you couldn't do a pie chart in Tableau, it was a huge philosophical debate. Were you pro-pie, were you anti-pie? And, and I was pro-pie and I was always criticized for it. And you can ask me about that later if you want. But now people are drawing starbursts and flowers and pinwheels in Tableau. The creativity is incredible, but the basics are so much the same. If you understand and love data, you should always have Tableau in your back pocket. You never know where it might take you. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. I had to include a photo of my daughter before she got jealous because it's all about my son. <laughs> and uh, thanks for having me. Wow, amazing. Puyo, I didn't know that there was so many aspects to your career. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, that's really inspirational um, for us. And I definitely feel a lot of what you said about uh, liking the first part of the project. <laughs> I feel like I've jumped around a lot myself. <laughs> um, and I uh, actually do use Tableau to win arguments as well. I've done that. Um, yes. I want a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to thank all of the, all the panelists for keeping their um bios succinct. I know that's not easy because all of you have done such wide, uh, great and varied things, but uh, I, I think this is a great opportunity for everybody to ask questions. So if anybody has questions, please post them in the chat and um, we'll try to get you to your questions or, uh, you know, maybe you can uh, unmute yourselves and uh, ask your question. So, um, but just let us know first if you have a question and then we'll uh, make time for it. So I think we'll start with uh, our general questions first, just to sort of start some conversation. Um, yeah. So uh, Catherine, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think this is a great question for all of the panelists. And so maybe you can just think about those uh, top two or three skills, but it's really what skills were the most crucial for you in developing your data career? We have some folks on the line who are looking to come into data and analytics what do you tell them that they should try to look at or focus on that uh, obviously has helped to shape you to where you are today? And we'll start with uh, Mark, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I think it's always best to start foundationally. So um, the only class that I use from college, like from a technical sense, was my database administration, which was basically learning SQL and like all the normal forms and denormalized data and things like that. So understanding kind of the foundational pieces uh, with how do you model data for um, presentation, how do you organize it, those types of things, um, I think are crucial when you're getting started. Because um, I think, I, I well, I've proved uh, the point with my seven-year-old daughter that you can teach Tableau to anybody. Um, she has a Tableau public profile. Uh, she has three visas out there. She actually made a data-driven decision on her third one. Um, but I showed her how to denormalize data and that was it. And like she created her own data sources, but all the other pieces come into play, the more mature the data sources become. Um, so that would probably be like the foundational piece. And then the, the weirdest thing is just to practice, um, you know, spend an hour a week outside of work doing some Tableau development, get really familiar with the tool. That way your speed for development improves. So you have more time to do more things and things become that much easier and kind of muscle memory second nature as you're going through it. Awesome, Sahar, I'd love to hear from you as well. What skills do you think our folks on the line should know about? Um, I'll echo what Mark said on the data side. Um, I usually tell people um, in our job postings, I don't put a lot of languages or tools that I need from them. I just say, do you understand relational databases? If you do understand relational databases, 
it's okay if you don't know SAS or if you don't know, you know, SQL or if you know one, I could teach you the other. So definitely data. I do, um, even in, in the teams, I'm not as technical as my teams. I never look at their code, I, but I always ask to see their data model. So do you understand the data? Can you model the data? Half of the projects that I've seen not succeed you can trace it back to the way that they designed their data model, the way that they're picturing their data. So definitely echo that. I don't want to see anybody start anything without having done profiling. So like me personally, I use Tableau a lot for doing just the first level of data profiling, just to understand my um, question. I don't like somebody sitting on like, again, like when I say I don't like, it's not like, oh, I'm forcing my teams to do that. But your brand, like you have to have a brand of, you know, intellectual curiosity of being prepared and all that kind of stuff. If you're sitting on data, don't go to a client, don't go to a partner and ask questions about that data that you could have answered yourself by doing simple, you know, profiling in the beginning. So understand your data, profile your data, have smart questions because you've already done your homework, create your data model. And then, you know, to Mark's point, visualization is, is, technically is it's easier to do but now the non-technical side of it which is the second thing I, I think it's important is what you hear everywhere everybody says know your client it's it's just become such a term that we are overusing but not knowing what exactly it means um so tell a story like I don't want to look at a tableau dashboard yet um tell me your story like sometimes I start on just on a piece of paper sometimes I start drawing what I want to show and sometimes I just start putting the titles of each story that I want to tell. Does my story hold, you know, now that I've done my data profiling, do I have a story that holds? Just, just write title sentences and then start populating those title sen sentences with the visualization that supports it and all that kind of stuff. The last thing I would say about, again, like knowing your client and knowing your visualization is um, incrementally sharing information, right? So again, you want to have a brand of not only delivering insights, but also uh, not shocking people as much. So it's not a good thing to go into a client meeting and show them a visualization and the subtext of that visualization being like, how stupid are you guys that you don't already know this, right? So it should always start from, I incrementally always go from the known and then one step further and one step further. Like your first, again, going back to know your data and understand your data, the first slide or the first, sorry, page of a visualization in my uh, opinion should be something that everybody knows and everybody agrees on, right? If you're showing sales in um, a retail network, your first slide should kind of like show the entire retail network, show the total number of whatever they, they count, you know, the, their stores, their sales, their people. That is where you get consensus. Guys, remember, this is what we have. This is our network. And every, when everybody starts nodding, it means, okay, now everybody understands you. We're starting from the same place. We are using the same data. And then now you start incrementally showing them stuff. So again, know your audience is a term that is not, opened up as much as it should but these are some examples of kind of like knowing your audience bringing them along the journey with you every time you're clicking so Fuya to your double click question right um you want the person to be coming with you you want when you're double clicking on a corner of a visualization that person in his head has already double clicked right so you tell a story and he's like yeah let's double click on July so when you double click on July he's kind of like coming with you so those are things that I think will help separate you from people that are just visualizing awesome. sorry long long answer but I it was a great answer passion. Fuyo you are not uh our our last or least I I need to know what's going on what do you think what is crucial for our folks to know um okay so I'll agree with everything that's been said so far definitely um understanding data shape is probably the biggest issue that I see um, with people who are struggling with their Tableau visualizations. Um, so that's that's a big thing. But the number one skill I think that as a freelancer I've had to have is to be a mind reader. So basically um, being able to understand what your client needs, but they may not be able to convey. 
Um, so you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes. Imagine if you were an accountant, a manager, um, you know, whatever position they might be in, you, you have to really be able to put yourself in their seat and imagine if, if, if you had these technical um, data skills, what would you build for yourself? What would make your job easier? What would um, get you farther ahead in the day? And um, that I think is one of the biggest things that you need to have to actually produce really good solutions. In IT, we are really well known for coming up with solutions that don't quite solve the problem. And so with a tool like Tableau, it's, it's so quick and fast to prototype and get to an end. And so the biggest thing I think is to make sure that you're doing the good things that um, your customer actually needs. And so I always say like, ah, uh, the biggest thing I do is, is I can read minds. That's, that's what you need to have as a skill in this job. Amazing. Awesome. Mind reader. I love it. Uh, <laughs> we, we do have a question from the community, a couple questions. Uh, do you mind if I insert them here? Uh, go yeah. Roland. Yeah, go for it. Great. So Nicholas has a, a question and uh, I actually really like this question. Uh, so the first question actually came through is what is the best way to encourage both your audience and your team uh, to work incrementally? Sorry, that's from Rajiv. Uh, so, so, so from Rajiv, what's the best way to encourage both your audience and your team to work incrementally to show the art of possible? And so how about we, uh, we start with Mark on that one? Sorry, I'm pausing to think on that. <laughs> okay. um, honestly, if so, there's I guess there's two schools of thought. Um, you know, when we're talking about incremental work, if your stakeholder has really succinct requirements that, that have been provided, the incremental stuff only really comes into play if you find something that they weren't expecting. Um, otherwise, like I find such value in working with people who understand the business data deeper than I do. Um, because through my career, I've worked in probably at least 10 different industries. Um, so I've never gotten to become a subject matter expert on any of them. Uh, so I have to rely on their business acumen to be able to really find the true insights. Like I can find data and find anomalies easy enough, but to actually understand what it's saying, I have to lean into the the business and that's where that incremental process really pays off nice Fuyo, do you have anything to add to this um the best way to encourage so i mean i think one of the cool things about tableau is that you can just dig right in with their data right away in the old days when you had to use uh reporting tools you you, you would build a, you built a query and then you built the layout and then but you never really saw it until you hit run um, the cool thing with a tool like Tableau is you can, and, and, and I agree with Sahar though, that you really have to dig in and profile the data first, but then once you have a good understanding of it, you can work um, in a workshop style setting and work with the people who um, know the data the best and then the people that have the technical skills to really move things around um, and, and mold and shape it. Um, and just having everyone on the same page, understanding that uh, you're not done. It's always, it's constantly going to be adjusted and, and um, it'll reflect the new things that you find out. Another thing too with Tableau is that the things that you design really depend on the data that's inside your data source. Like um, in the old days, you would, you know, you, you'd decide on your layout first and then whatever data came in is kind of what came in. But it, I find that the decisions you make completely depend on what is actually contained in there. So it's really nice to be able to have this tool that lets you do it on the fly with your actual data. I mean, I don't know, maybe I sound really old, but you didn't used to be able to do this. So being able to work with the actual data that makes sense to people, um, it's just, it's a huge bonus to, to get your team working together. Thank you. Uh, Sahara, I'll give you an opportunity to add to that if you like. Sure. Um, I actually like, I, I can't, tell you who the quote is from or the terminology is from. I'm, I'm very bad at remembering those, but um, I remember about agile analytics. So um, agile analytics, the way that I've seen it defined, they talk about um, inclusive 
iterative incremental. So um, what everybody was saying, inclusive means bring the client with you every step of the way. You don't have to wait for uh, having a product before you show them. You can have them be part of the creation of that product. Again, like I go to, even if you're drawing it on a piece of paper, make sure that you put it in front. It doesn't have to be pretty and all done before the client sees it. So inclusive, get them to see every step and see if you're going in the right direction before you spend so much time on it. Um, and then it's iterative because then they ask you to make changes to it or to include or exclude something. And then it's incremental. So the first two parts are what make it incremental because then you are one step further and then you turn around and then do the inclusive and iterative. You know, bring in the elements of design thinking, ask them to just in simple terms explain to you i'm trying to do this like the final thing not the how to do it but what is your objective what do you want to like what is your client journey and then help me help me be part of that with you and just i'll add a very very real example i think we were working with our marketing team who wanted to do a campaign in the ottawa region and um what we did exactly what fuyo said like we sat with them with the data so we staged the data first we made sure that we have the ability to on the fly start slicing and dicing and filtering. And what they wanted to do is, for example, in their head, they thought that we want to send a campaign to, let's say, and I'm making this up, but let's say people between the ages of 35 and 55 who live in these postal codes in the Ottawa region, and we want to make sure that their household income is this much or whatever, or they let's say they don't have a premium credit card with us and we want to have this campaign. And you know, banking campaigns, when you're sending people emails or mails, the response rate on those are very small. So, you know, if you want to get 1000 people to respond to you, you may have to send the email to 100,000 people. And um, the good thing is that, again, I'm going to refer back to what Fuyo said, like, originally, this would have been marketing, sending something to uh, MIS, like to management information systems or BI or technology, and saying, hey, I want these criteria, they would run the query, they would send them a list, and the list would have 25,000 people in it. And then marketing would, would realize that, oh, my criteria were too tight. I need more people to run this campaign. So they would come back and they say, oh, you know what? Like, let's add these three um, postal codes to it as well. Oh yeah, you know what? Like, let's open it up to more income brackets or something like that. All of this now was done in one session with the client. One session, one hour, you sit with a client, you open up everything. When you leave that meeting, they have their campaign. They know exactly what are the criteria that they need to run. Instead of all of this would have taken like three weeks back and forth with, uh, with technology. Back in the old days. <laughs> I think you taught me about being iterative and, and how that worked. And it was uh, very helpful for myself, for sure. Uh, now, I do want to get to Nicholas's question. Uh, he was the first to ask. So from Nicholas, how has your approach to storytelling changed when working with colleagues or clients? And I'll start with Sahar this time. Oh, yeah, you're right. It does change. And you, you realize that you hit the you hit the limits of your tools or you hit the limits of uh, what they what they're talking about so i've been i've been in areas so i've been in marketing analytics where everybody is speaking analytics but not as much visual and then you know the move to audit for example was very very different so what i realized was when i was in product groups for example we are designing products for the masses we're designing campaigns that are going to go mass um, outside and Tableau was a perfect tool, for example, for that. Everything is at the, everything is done at the aggregate level, right? So you're showing people clients behavior at different age groups. You're showing how people's, you know, financial needs change and you, you generalize, right? We have data, we aggregate it, we show the trending and we generalize. And everything is at the, again, like at the aggregate because we're planning for it, we're designing products for it. Uh, when I moved to um, internal audit, for example, it was very, very different. And it took me a little while to understand that um, in audit, it's not the rule of the aggregates. We know that 99% of the time, our systems, our people, our processes are working properly. We're, we're looking for the times that they're not, right? So now you switch your visualization, you switch your storytelling, to the outlier analysis, to the once in a lifetime, you know, events that may happen. And in many cases, you actually have to give them the ability to go down to the actual record level, right? Like you see, you see something that doesn't look like, look right in a corner of your universe. 
And that's exactly where you have to now focus and they need to know exactly what happened. You know, like we do visualizations for internal audit right now that show trending on um, technology tickets and technology incidents, right? So we are happy that there are not that many critical incidents happening across the bank over all of our systems. But as an internal auditor, they are going to focus on the one week of the one month on the one single application that, you know, the technology incident tickets, tickets went up for a certain reason. And that's where they want to focus on and go to the tiny, tiniest level of detail. So, so that was a big shift for me going from the aggregates and the, you know, the big trends to the outliers and to the once in a lifetime uh, stories. Thank you. How about uh, Mark? Do you have any thoughts on the same question? Um, I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the first, uh, you know, you got to know your audience when you're presenting anything to them. So when you're working with a particular stakeholder, their data literacy might be higher or lower than the last one. So you really got to adjust the way that you're talking to make sure that you're giving them the information that they need um, in a way that they understand. Um, that That's generally the, the biggest key. And, and I always, and regardless of what that, you know, data literacy level is, I always try to make them better than they were the day before. So like if they don't understand something fully, you know, I will try to, you know, teach, have that as a teaching moment to say, here's how you would interact with this, or here's how you would read this um, so that they become stronger consumers of data uh, so that the next time we work on a project, we can kind of push things a little bit further. Thank you. And I'll go right to the next question. And Puyo, this one's coming to you. This is a warning. Um, so this also comes from Nicholas. So are certificates, boot camps, are those enough to get a career in a data science without a computer science degree? And then Nicholas had stated that he has a BCom in accounting and finance, but also loves using Tableau and Python. Um, I definitely think that you don't need a degree in, in the IT discipline. Um, I don't have one. I, I, I have a, what do I have, a diploma from, a, you know, a technical college. Um, but I think the biggest um, thing that's helped me be successful is just being naturally passionate about it. Um, being naturally curious about data, um, like I, if I get really involved in 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 a data project, it's in my dreams. I can't stop. Like the 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 will to learn it kind of comes from inside, and then I think you'll be fine. But um, can you just take a boot camp and then call yourself a Tableau developer and then go make you know tons of money at it? Maybe I don't know. Um, but I think the, the the biggest indicator of success is if, if you really like it and you're really into it, it it'll come out in your work and, and you'll learn a ton. That's a great answer. Um, maybe, um, Catherine, do you want to go back to the list on the uh, on the screen? Hang on, Roland. I just want to add oh, one thing you, onto the sure. certificate and boot camps. Sure. Um, I, I would say it might be enough to get you the interview. But when the rubber hits the road, it's not going to be enough to get you where you need to be. So I encourage anybody who is wanting to get into the field or get further in the field to actually have a portfolio. So if it's Python, set up a GitHub that you can put on your resume that people can go look at your work. If it's Tableau, have a Tableau public profile and do a couple of community projects to fill it out to show your skills. Um, because I can't tell you the number of times I've inter interviewed somebody and they put, you know, they they had a certification, Tableau certification, and they're this and they're that. And then I asked them very basic questions about, well, how do you do this inside Tableau? And they can't answer it. So there's a thing, there's a difference between passing an academic class and applying those academic skills in a real world situation. So, so it's good to have a portfolio nowadays because everybody, they'll download Tableau and they'll put it on their resume. Mm -hmm. That's a, actually that's actually a very good uh, addition to that question. Thank you. Uh, but I, you know, maybe I'll just stick with that for a little bit longer. Sahar, have you ever looked in people's uh, uh, public profiles when you're in a hiring position to see what they've done with other tools, like on a Tableau public? Have you? Uh, taken a look? No, but I should, right? Um, no, I don't. And uh, so one thing I would say with. Um, I encourage my team to go to Tableau public sometimes to just see how things are done. Uh, but I would say Tableau Public, there's two types of um, visualizations in Tableau Public. Either it's very, very 
um, elementary or it's very, very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the ones who are good go very fancy and you guys know big corporations you don't like I cannot afford to walk executives through the like how to read a sunburst or how to read like a Sankey or something like that right I, I can't like this is between the hundred or so of us or the 50 or so of us um, executives have very, very short attention spans. And if you put, uh, um, I always say that if you put a nice visualization in front of them and in the corner of it, there's a red dot, they're gonna spend the entire meeting talking about that red dot that accidentally is on the screen. Like, so um, so it's hard to judge people from what they've put on um, Tableau Public when I know that I have to convince them to when they join something like my team to simplify and not do, do all of those fancy things and all that kind of stuff. But I do say I agree with everyone. Uh, I don't look for certifications. Sometimes too many certifications are actually a, a warning sign when we see it. And for the person who asked the question, I forgot, but I think you said that they have a BCom. I would say a building on top of other disciplines. So it always goes back to back to differentiating yourself. I've had people who talk about, you know, they have been great salespeople, they have been great um, marketing people, they have been great HR people, all that kind of stuff. And they ask about a career change into analytics and about going to these boot camps and spending, you know, five, $10,000. And I always tell them, no, like you're right now, people coming to the entry levels of analytics are PhDs in software engineering or PhDs in statistics, you cannot compete with them. If you have put in 10 years into HR, that's where you have to compete. Yeah. Be the same as like stay in HR and be the one HR person who also understands data, right? So if if in your day-to-day -day jobs you have a chance of showcasing to your managers and to your peers how better your Excel dashboards look or Excel even files and summaries, whatever you are doing today, even if it's on Excel, start improving that, start making a name yourself for showing how you're doing that better. And then maybe then the next step would be Tableau and maybe the next step would be a career move into the analytics, but start differentiating yourselves from your peers, wherever you are, use, use data to do that part for you. Don't compete with people who are coming with six or seven years of you know Python programming or software engineering or anything like that. If you have already started a career, if you haven't and you're in school, again, like put it on top of everything else that you have. It's going to be much more powerful that way. I was just going to interject quickly here because uh, I think Mark, you had a real world fake data project yeah. going for a while. So there are some, uh, if you check out uh, Mark's blog, there's some data sources there to like build sort of quote unquote business dashboards uh, for your Tableau profile. So if you're looking for something like that, then. Yeah, that's so Sahar's like point about Tableau public being very fancy and like whimsical was the exact reason I started uh, real world fake data. So there's 12 data sources across a bunch of different industries um, that people actually went out and built business dashboards. That was the whole purpose of the project to kind of put those kind of realistic dashboards out into the world and help people build out their portfolios. So um, if you're looking to do that, the real world fake data, uh, it's still out there on data.world, uh, all the data sources, and you could go to sonsahierarchies.com and find out all the details and the links. Great. Thank you. Uh, Candace. Yeah, so I think uh, one question that I wanted to ask maybe from our list, uh, although there's quite an interesting uh, conversation going on in the chat about pie charts, if you guys want to tune in. Uh -huh. uh <laughs> I do. I, I'm so glad that somebody asked about the pie charts um, because like Tableau in the early days would not even permit, they wouldn't, they refused to introduce pie charts for the longest time. And finally they were like, fine, we'll do it. But pie charts are bad, 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 bad. And I just remember being like, I don't understand. Like, I get that. Yeah, they, they take up more space than you need to. But there's something about pie charts that people are intrinsically drawn to. And I remember back then saying, I think that we feel um, drawn to pie charts because it's one of the first graphs that we ever learn to decode, which is a clock. When we're learning to tell time, 
we learn that circle and we learn the sections of time. And so I've always said there, there is a purpose. Like, yes, I agree. We don't need the 17 slices, but there's something about decoding the quantity out of a hundred that doing it in a pie chart just makes so much sense for people. And then, and so tying that into my presentation with the ADHD diagnosis, I've come to understand that I can't tell time. So, so it's one of, it's one of the indicators that uh, people with ADHD really struggle figuring out how much time has elapsed. I need to see an analog clock. I can't, a digital clock doesn't tell me how much time has passed. I have no idea. And this all like the whole, like, I mean, the blessed, six months, eight months has just been like glass shattering constantly. Like, oh, that's why I do that. Um, but this is why for me, pie charts never went away because people were always still drawn to them, even though everybody said they were garbage. So that's my theory about pie charts. Can I add something? Um, Sophia, I, I'm with you. It shouldn't go away. Um, I'll just tell you my rule of thumb for pie charts. I, I always see pie charts as, you know, kind of like they're like this, right? They're slices. And that's the way I see them. If you want to show you know, uh, smaller than or greater than, if you want to point people to that, I would go with pie charts. If you want to say that, you know, the biggest slice, so 60, 40, if you want to show a 60, 40, go with pie chart or maximum three slices, but just think of what a pie chart, the slice of it looks like. And like, that should be your first rule of thumb. If you want people to rank one, two, three, four, five, no like go with a bar chart or something. Oh yeah, no, but and I, I definitely color, agree. Like yeah. pie charts have been abused over time for sure. Yeah, but so like very powerful, very powerful if you sh if you use it for the purpose that it's best for, it's it's more powerful than using any other thing if you use it properly. Yeah, I, I agree, but pie, pie charts are the Aquaman of data visualization. Aquaman's good at one thing and one thing only. Yes. <laughs> and if an oil tanker is sinking, and I could call Aquaman, who's really good underwater, or I can call Batman, who's got a submarine, or Superman, who can breathe underwater. They do other things, too. So if I'm picking a superhero, I'm going to pick somebody who can, like, do all the stuff. So, like, 99% of the time, you're going to find me in a different visualization. Because if I'm looking at two slices of pie and the 60% is what I'm po pointing at, why not just use a big, a big number? Like, 60%. Like, if you know it's 60%, you know the other half's 40%. I don't need to give you that visual. You can do that kind of, like unconsciously so yeah except there's people like me who can't who can't and, and so right. and so that's another thing like the whole the whole concept of like this is why i do data visualization because numbers don't make any sense to me that's right yeah, because 60 40 right uh mark it doesn't have to be 60 40 we're just showing bigger R right no i i get it but i'm just i'm just saying like i think there are more effective ways to do it but there is an accessibility uh point to that you're right yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting because I guess in the like in the new COVID world, like where we're all like a little bit more t uh, cognizant of like you know being uh, tolerant of new um, parameters, right? Like you know, like we've got a, a new world and we're more online than we were before, and y you know that you have to really uh, communicate in like more than one way sometimes. So it's you have to be cognizant of those uh, sort of drawbacks i guess like pros and cons of seeing it one way or the other so i think it's it's interesting I, and I, td I, I know there's well catherine's here on the line from td like td has done a lot in accessibility and and about you know sort of making all of those um you know sort of you know needs i guess like kind of conscious for people awesome well with that we have to uh start wrapping up this has been incredible <laughs> awesome. started Kenny, a war. Leave it to you i know but we'll we'll take the war to another tug and we'll come <laughs> ready to pie chart battle it out uh, pie chart okay. panel coming up <laughs> yeah i know i could do a whole panel just on pie charts i said and it's a very interesting conversation right because i mean it's like puyo puyo says it's like more than it, you know, it's like how you see it. Like, so some people see numbers better, very few people see numbers better, but you know, there's like, always going to be somebody that goes, but I see it better in a table. And you're like, how can you see it better in a table? Like, yeah. <laughs> but you know, people see things different ways and it's about being cognizant of that and being able to deliver your message to your audience in an appropriate way. Yeah. 
And I, I mean, I've seen I've seen examples like uh, Eva Murray did a small multiple pie chart and it was just two slices. But because it was done in a temporal way, you could actually see the pie slices decreasing as time went on. I'm like, it, it, it was not maybe the best practice way to do it, but it was easy to get. So it's just it's it's truly an it depends business. Yeah. Uh, and so, like Catherine said, we should wrap up and uh, get you guys back to back to your Friday afternoon so you can wrap up for the weekend. Woohoo! Uh, but uh, we just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we are going to have another Cross Canada tug. Uh, Julie Savageau is uh, volunteered to do a session on Tableau server administration and governance. Uh, I know a lot of people ask about this, uh, and it's a great topic, and Julie's quite the expert on it, so we're very much looking forward to this. Uh, so mark your calendars for April 27th. Uh, it will be uh, obviously virtual, so it's open to everybody. Um, and I mean, uh, we'll advertise it all across Canada, but for sure, I hope everybody else can join in. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you.